This is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is November 18th, 2015. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at the Purdue Libraries. Today I'm interviewing a member of Purdue's class of 1953, Mr. Paul Petty. This is a follow-up interview to one we conducted a few years ago with Mr. Petty, I think 2013. Mr. Petty, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us again. We really appreciate it, and it's really nice to talk with you again. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, so I guess I'm going to jump in with the first question. Um, what, what do you remember about being an engineering student at Purdue, and which friends and teachers do you remember the most? I guess you did. <laughs> I guess that was your first lesson in problem solving, right? <laughs> <Try> to... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> again. 
did Doc Zucro know that he was making those errors in the uh, computations on the board? No, no. They were usually simple errors, you know, like plus or minuses or uh, transforming from one side to the other. And But, you know, they, they messed everything up. <laughs> did you guys tell him <laughs> that... Did you guys later tell him that he'd made mistakes? Well, I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so his personality, he wouldn't have taken well to that, huh? No, he... Uh, yeah, no, he, he, he was a martinet, I guess you would have to say. He oh. would walk in and start and wham, and we'd spend an hour and uh, him talking and then no, no interaction with the students at all. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, but lecture. you know, at, at that time he was the uh, right. I guess he was the first PhD granted by Purdue University. Hmm. So he he always had a cachet about him. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I had opted for the propulsion option uh, in aeronautical engineering. You, we could have, at that time, we could have either structure, aerodynamics, or propulsion. And I took propulsion. Uh, no regrets. Mm -hmm. Very, very, you know, and one of the things, Dr. She asked me, how many credits did we have to have in those days? And it was 168 and two thirds <laughs> credits for a degree. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was amazing that <laughs> uh, we even tried to do that. Yeah. But it was too it was too heavy a load. Uh, I could handle five classes. That's a lot. But anyway, oof, I survived. <laughs> Didn't worry too much about it. Yeah. Were you involved in any uh, aviation clubs or any other groups on campus? I we we had formed somebody. I forget who formed it before. We had we had an aeronautical engineering uh, club, Gamma Alpha Rho, which doesn't exist anymore. Did you spend a lot of time out at the Purdue Airport? Um. Well, the, we had a lot of classes at the Purdue Airport. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Clouser and, and Stanley's offices were at the airport, in the airport building. The administrating building, the one on the eastern side, I guess, as you went in. Uh, so, and structures and aerodynamics. And propul the propulsion labs were there, mm -hmm. so we spent time in those. Uh, How 
you get? Yeah, it was, it was, you know, you look back on it and say, wow, what a, what a nice time. Well, uh, always better when you look back. <laughs> yeah. George Palmer was, was an instructor. Oh, Miss Dr. Palmer, yeah, George Palmer. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was just an <laughs> instructor at that time. And I, we gave him some gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll ask him about that, because Reed and I are going to inter- interview him, I hope, very soon. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the, we had a small axial flow jet engine down in the lab, and George's office was up on the ground floor. So uh, our job for the day was to start the jet engine up and make some measurements, and so we did. Here comes George flying down the stairs. And some previous group had turned off the lubricating system because they had inserted a a test, a measuring gadget in in the line. So so the oil was turned off. (laughs) And, you know, we we didn't know how the engine was supposed to sound. <laughs> but it really uh, it got his attention <laughs> quickly. But, so, uh, so did you have huge cavitation? No, it just you know the, it just screeched. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We, we did a we did a we did that too. They had the big uh, uh, big blowers. I forget what they're known. Now, Mr. Petty, do you yes. remember um, seeing other clubs uh, mentioned at Purdue, such as the Aero Modelers Club or the Aero uh, Nautical Club? No, I did not. I, I, of course, was a Navy pilot at this time. Correct. And, and so, uh, yeah, I had a club by it. <laughs> <laughs> which required me to fly uh, one weekend every month. Uh, But Gamma Alpha Rho was our engineering, aeronautical engineering club at the time, and uh, it's been replaced by somebody, I forget. So Uh, so I I didn't get in many other clubs. Now, did you partake in any events at Purdue um, 
I re- recall seeing something in the airliner uh, about the American Rocket Society had a guest speaker, uh, Werner von Braun, um, at Purdue Memorial Union. Did you attend anything like that here, at Purdue? Yes, I, I went to those kind of courses, those kind of events. Yes. Uh, and I remember Werner von Braun uh, saying that the Rocket Society was not the So you were Before I started Oh, so you're in your mid twenties at that point? Yes. Yeah. Was your... They had a high opinion of, of Purdue, that was for sure. Mm-hmm. What was your first job out of school? Like... I went to, I had, well, in the Navy, I had, my, my uh, aircraft was the, the chance for it. So were they um, Purdue? Were you working with some Purdue engineering graduates? I'm sorry. Were you working with some Purdue engineering graduates in your first job or two? Oh yes, yeah, yeah I three or four of them, including my boss was a <laughs> one of Zucro's students. So uh, yeah, that that was nice. It was nice to go with people who knew who knew what you had been through. Right. And who who yeah. was that? Who was 
was your first boss, the one? Yeah, my first boss was Ed Marshall. Oh, Ed Marshall. Okay, you mentioned him, yeah. Yeah, so he'd gotten a master's under Zucro. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that, that yeah. worked out First. very well. Do you, do you remember who the other Purdue graduates were, Rita, Rita asked? I'm sorry? Do you remember who the other Purdue graduates were that you were working with? Howard Rodine. Who later went to Lawrence Livermore. Uh, Jim Mutterback, who, who had worked on the YouTube program. Uh, you know, which is, that was my first experience getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I was doing aerodynamic testing on a Mark Mach 2 inlet design, and I was testing it over at Dangerfield, which was the facility that, uh, uh, geez, a long time ago. <laughs> Well, that, um, if I could ask you about the, an, another, I think, well, was this a black program, Dinosaur? Um, what challenges did the Dinosaur Project raise for you and your team? And were you confident? Well, we were supposed to build a as much money with Walt Disney Engineering to build 
So you thought it w it could have been successful? Oh. It might have been. What's the other clearance? FCI? Oh. FCI. FCI. Mm -hmm. it's, it's is it sensitive stiff? compartmented in information, oh. which is that says, you know, that everything is compartmented on a program. Oh. So if it has a top secret code word, then it's an FCI program, and, and they have much, much, much stricter security requirements than just top secret. Mr. Petty, this is Michael Smith. Did you work at the GE Missile and Space Division before Dinosaur, and could you comment on your experiences? No, it was after. That was after? Yeah. I, working on the Dinosaur Project was really my first in-depth work uh, for space, and I said, this, this is neat. You know, that nobody knows that much about what's going to be happening and, and this is a field that's just gonna explode so I got in I got to get involved in space engineering and then I had a choice of either and GE space missiles and space was building hardware uh, and JPL was building hardware so I applied to both got the same offer for both Mm. That, that's why I went to PE. Mm -hmm. Did you have family there, or why did you choose the East Coast? Oh, I don't know. I was just, I was just more familiar. My Navy career, I spent all my time on the East Coast. Oh, yeah. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit what you did at GE? Was this on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia? Oh, yes. 3198 Chestnut Street. <laughs> <laughs>
That must but, have... uh, must have been very exciting. I mean, you guys were figuring this out for the first time, right? This was... Yes. These oh, were... yeah. We, the, uh, not as bad as Corona. On, on Corona, the first... Uh, you know, we... GE built the recovery vehicle for the, for the film. Our first 12 slots. Which components did you work on for Cambit and Hexagon, or was it the program in general? Oh, after that again. Um, which components specifically were you working on for Gambit and Hexagon? Well, in, in Gambit, uh, one of the problems was it was a short duration. Uh, it was a five-day flight, and with the large pieces of glass, they didn't stabilize temperature-wise, uh, you know, until three or four or five days. So you'd be out of focus and everything else. So we came up with a, with a nice scheme in that we put a brine jacket around the spacecraft on the ground for, for several days before it flew and ran the temperature of the, of the outside of the spacecraft at 65 degrees. This required then our in-flight temperature controls to, to operate and, and heat, heat the uh, objects, specifically the holding flap, to 70 plus or minus a half a degree. So that, that saved a lot of agony. Hmm. Uh, the, we had a door on Gambit that opened to take the pictures. But of course, as soon as we opened the door, then the to folding flap uh, started losing energy just, you know, to, to the ground. And but what we did is we put heaters, we had a heater system, or radiation heater system, mounted on little poles, so that when the door closed, then, then we could heat the, we could heat the surface of the folding flap uh, back to where it was. And actually, it, uh, we, we kept Gambit pretty, pretty well stabilized, and it worked Mr. Petty, did you also work on the reentry vehicle for Gambit? Yes, but but not not its reentry phase. I the, the the problem I worked on was getting it in you know through powered flight and into orbit, and then stabilizing the temperature in orbit. And in the beginning, this is an interesting story. <laughs> In the beginning, it finally dawned on us that the reason the reentry uh, parachute and, and stuff weren't working was that the battery was frozen. Mm. And we said, how can that be? You know, how can this be? Uh, the temperature of, of something in space uh, stabilized like that is that is proportional to the ratio of the solar absorption then over the uh, infrared emissions. And we had always assumed that the 
giggling. I, I did her. Uh, I ran that program at research. And he had a research department at Valley Forge. And the, the paint came off, you know, just in a little cone. It was, uh, it was a startling re revelation to us. <laughs> and so what we did is that instead of using paint on the pad, we, we put a white paper covering over it with a string in it so that when we pulled the umbilical cords out, or launched, and we, this, we've also pulled a string which cut the paper, and, mm. and we, went, we went into orbit <laughs> uh, with a black RV, not a white RV. <laughs> uh, but I model, I model the Yeah, um, it it sounds like the engineering process. I mean, you could only you could model just so much, but you really had to just run these tests into this unknown, you know, space. True, we, yeah. we didn't have the luxury of saying that the things that didn't agree with our model were just outliers <laughs> and didn't mean anything, like the climate guys. <laughs> <laughs> They did mean things. Right. Um, okay. What, what was life like outside of work while you were working on these black government programs? Um, well, I had one great advantage, and that was that my wife was, had been cleared previously oh. uh, on other programs. So she, she understood, you know, what went on in the black world. I was like, I, you know, I got along pretty well. It, the, uh, whenever, of course, whenever we were flying, you know, you'd get telephone calls in the middle of the night and all of that. But uh, I, I led a pretty, uh, I led a pretty normal life. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, the programs were invasive in your life. They pretty much left you alone. Well, tell me again. Uh, I said, uh, for the most part, the government programs didn't invade your life. They left you alone for the most part. You were free to do whatever you liked. Yes, I think I think that's true. Although they were. We had a uh, 
what year was that, Mr. Petty? That would have been early 70s, maybe mid 70s. Uh, our first flight was 70, oh, Hexagon was in 71. And the last flight which blew up was in 86. And the reason it got declassified, they had decided early on that 25 years after your last launch, the program would be declassified. Mm -hmm. So that's how Hexagon and Gambit uh, got declassified in 2011. Mm -hmm. Did you work with any other fellow Purdue students on those programs, Mr. Petty? Any other? Uh, Purdue graduates? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, Charlie Hood was my supervisor at GE. He, he was a double E. Uh, Donald Haas was a deputy head of the uh, National Reconnaissance Office. He also was a double Charlie Quinn worked for me. He, he was a mechanical. Uh, no, I didn't have any aeronautical engineers in working with me. But, and I'm sure there were a lot more Purdue engineers around that I just didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Petty, how, how did the idea of the Hubble Space Telescope arise within your company, um, Perkin Elmer, and what made it motivated you and others to turn a classified project to a civilian use? Uh, well, I, the short answer is money, I guess. <laughs> we, we, of course, the, uh, the facility in Danbury uh, had been, Perkin Elmer had built it, and that just a brick and mortar and the land and all of that, that, that took about $5 million in 1966. The CIA then furnished all of the, all of the inside equipment, including the 50 foot chambers and the 30 foot chambers. And all that. Uh, that was all paid for by CIA. And I suppose they still maintain ownership of that facility, of the facilities inside. Uh, that would cost them about $35 million to, to, just to access the facility. So the idea of, and, and by the mid-70s, uh, we had been too successful. Uh, we didn't need the, the number of, of vehicles that we had projected that we were going to use, so we, we had spare capabilities, and so we said, why, why, should, why should the government go build a new facility for space telescopes? Why don't you just use ours? Right. And, you know, to our surprise, uh, the Deputy Director of Science and Technology for the CIA and head of the National Reconnaissance Office and the head of NASA all thought that was reasonable and so they signed a, a, a mem mem memorandum of agreement that says that we could we could propose a space telescope using the Danbury facility and uh, but we would have to cost we would have to cost our proposal as though we could that makes sense. <laughs> can, you, can you say that again? Cost so we could. What they said we had to oh. do is we had to pretend that we had to go build a new facility like the Eastman Kodak team. Oh. And so to, for everything to be fair, <laughs> even though we knew we were going to use the existing facility. So, but that worked out. It worked out fine. modified uh, we had a 30 foot tank in uh, uh, back in 
Mr. Petty, when did you first learn of the plans for the large space telescope?
Mm-hmm. I don't care whether it's in focus or not. I just want so much energy. And, uh, mm-hmm. The pictures were not were fuzzy. <laughs> or not in sharp focus. So, how did it happen? Well, it happened because we missed a key process. So normally, Mr. Petty, the edges of the mirror are rolled upwards? Down. They down. Were down. Down. Now, was that uh, before or after it was launched? That was after the launch. Okay. After the launch. Uh, and then uh, the uh, wide field camera pictures were blurry. Okay. And we quickly knew why. But okay. So then did your team work on the, on the, on the plan for the fix? So when the optical uh, assembly was delivered, I believe that was in 84, NASA didn't do any testing then to also see if there was any problems?
Well, the, the Hubble Space Telescope has certainly been a success uh, in the end. Oh, yeah. And uh, if it weren't for Hexagon and what you all learned there, I think uh, things yeah, might... That, uh... Mr. Yeah, Pitty. And of course, we we didn't hear about that. The solid right? hmm. Okay. Mr. Petty. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking back, aren't you? I guess that's the drawback from the black programs is that no no one knows what 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 you've accomplished except for a handful of people until they're declassified of course but all that hard work and success Well, he couldn't help it, right? <laughs> yeah, but he couldn't help it. And it, you know, and you know, we we hear all the problems with Hillary's emails. Man, we 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 ran that program. I had maybe a thousand people working for me, and we never had a problem. I mean, they we all knew. Very, very important that uh, people from the 
Mr. Petty, I was wondering if you could tell us um, the how many significant projects uh, that are still classified that you have contributed to or worked on. So you're not involved in any other uh, classified programs that haven't been able to be disclosed yet? Mr. Mr. Petty, one. Yes, it's, you know, our black program still going on, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And they will continue to go on. Mm -hmm. We're down to our last question. We don't want to keep you all day. Um, okay. <laughs> what, what, what do you think was the greatest achievement you accomplished in your career? Oh, Hexagon. Hexagon, I, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Well, it was pioneering work that you all did in Hexagon. And... Yeah, yeah, we did, we did. Mm-hmm. And I had a, you know, I had a team of absolutely outstanding, outstanding engineers. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Petty. I really appreciate you doing this part two to your interview. Um, I think it's... uh, Okay, yep, thank you. I I enjoy it, of course. Uh, I can always... And I have given, you know, I have a uh, canned speech on Hexagon, which I have given several times, trying to get people to understand. Well, and hope these these oral histories will be on record here for a very long time. So, okay. And we have students who use who will be using them, and just very grateful. All right. So thank you. Okay.